I was actually living a very normal, average Westerner life. I was very focused on material possessions, financial wealth. I actually had a goal of being a millionaire by the time I was 30 years old. I'm 34 and I have $6,000, so that obviously uh, <laughs> isn't the case. There was a change of plans about 10 years ago. I realized through watching some documentaries that many of you have seen and, and reading books and hanging out with different people. I was in San Diego, California, where I met Chrissy, who was over here, and we were starting to wake up at the same time. And what happened is I realized that basically I was destroying the earth in every single action that I took. The food that I was eating, the car that I was driving, the gas that I was pumping into the car, the house that I was living in, the water that I was drinking that was being sucked across the desert where half of it evaporates into the air and the ground. Even every drop of water that I was drinking was causing destruction. My, my, my money was in IRAs that were supporting fossil fuels and cigarette companies and all of these things I didn't stand for. I was supporting the military industrial complex, the police industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industries, the prison industrial complex is what I meant to say, not police. I was part of all of that. Everything that I was doing was causing suffering to humans, to other species, and to this earth. And I just said, no way am I going to keep doing that. I was 25 years old at the time, I'm 34 now, and I just said to myself, Dude, if I live to be 75, that's another 50 years on this earth. I'm not going to live another 50 years as a complete hypocrite. Like, I realized that I was living a complete hypocrisy to my belief system because I didn't believe in destroying the earth, but I was doing it. So I decided that I was going to just radically transform my life starting then in 2011. But what I decided I was going to do was um, take it one step at a time because radical transformation doesn't happen with one little thing you got to have stepping stones. So I made a list of all the changes that I wanted to make in my life. Over a hundred changes that I wanted to make and I put it up in my kitchen in San Diego uh, on a piece of paper where I had a pen taped next to it so I could check them off one at a time. And it was in my kitchen right through the front door so everybody saw it. So it was my way of like keeping myself accountable by having it like right there for everybody to see. So over a period of two years, I just started changing my life one little bit at a time. And at the time, all, most of my food was coming from Walmart. Plastic packaged food, factory farm food. Then I put it in two more plastic bags, put it in my trunk, drove it home, and put this garbage inside of my body. So I started to change the food I was eating. You know, first I went to Trader Joe's because I thought that was better, but wake up. Trader Joe's isn't better, it looks better, but it's... If it's nom, maybe nom really better, I'm not exactly sure, but it's not living off the land, that's for sure. So I started changing my life, you know, what I was putting in my body, stopped getting, you know, wasted drunk and, you know, putting all my resources into that and started to ride a bike and drive the car less and started to change the ways that I was interacting with other people and, you know, from little things to bigger things. Eventually, after about a year and a half, I got rid of my car and had no car to pump fossil fuels in. And continuously made these changes, and at the center of so much of this was food. Because what I realized is, there's a lot of things that we do that cause destruction, but pretty much every human being eats every single day. Like, that form of destruction is at the center of almost every human's life. And I realized that I thought food was one of the greatest gateway, getaway, uh, gateways to completely transforming our life. It is our life. It is the food that nourishes our body, it's our medicine that keeps us alive, it's our social circle, it's what we do with our friends, with our family, we have emotional attachments to it. Without it, we perish. And it's, it's at the center of every single human being's life. And at the same time, it's one of the most destructive ways that we interact with the earth. So that was a big part of my wake up and what I was shifting. And I had this idea at the time, like, wow, you know, could not could you maybe, like, not go to the grocery store anymore? Like, could you actually grow and, you know, collect all your food from the land? And at that time, it was an idea. I mean, I was still going to Walmart and then Trader Joe's, then the farmer's market, you know, got that over time. But I wasn't ready to go there yet. Um, I grew a little bit of my own food. I had a couple of raised beds, and I was making these changes. So fast forward to about 2016. I've been transforming my life for five years. I've done a lot of activism around food and other issues, and I finally said, by the way, is this thing working well? Yeah, yeah we can yeah, hear it's you. It's possible none of you are hearing anything. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> Unlikely, but... Um, and... Let's see, I got myself off track here. Five years. Five years, yep. And so then it's, I finally am feeling like, okay, maybe I can do, maybe I can try this. Can I try to go a year with no grocery stores or restaurants, nothing packaged or processed, remove myself so deeply from what is so entrenched into our lives in a destructive way? So I decided that I was going to do it, probably in around 2016. I don't remember how the, you know, where, where, where exactly it came from. So I had a couple problems first, though. One, um, I didn't live anywhere, and I didn't own any land. So, you know, I had to figure out where I was going to put this garden that I had in mind. Um, <laughs> and I uh, didn't really have much money. I had a backpack with uh, 111 possessions at the time, and that was everything that I owned, maybe 5,000 bucks or something like that. So I didn't really have that going for me. Um, so I decided Florida, because, well, you know, it's got the ability to grow food year-round. I had grown almost nothing, as close to nothing in my life, a few raised beds, and uh, I had experience, like, I would plant a lot of things at community gardens or fruit trees, but I was never really around to see them actually grow to the point I could eat them. And my permaculture design certificate's more theoretical, like, I didn't have, you don't, you don't actually really learn how to grow food. So I was starting there, like, kind of square one. So what I decided to do, I arrived in Orlando after visiting there one time, and uh, what I decided to do was ask people, uh, how would you like your front yard to be turned into a garden? And in exchange for me turning your lawn into a garden, you get to have a garden, and you get to eat all the food you want from it. And when I leave, it's yours. All the work is yours. You just need to not like lawns enough to let me experiment on this place, basically. And uh, pretty soon I had a wait list of people that wanted me to turn their yard into a garden. So I did end up turning six yards into gardens, and that's where I was based in, uh, just two miles from downtown Orlando. And I chose Orlando because I wanted to be in with the people. It's like the project I did where I was in New York City and I wore all my trash for a month while living like the average American. I, was, I wanted to be in front of people so that they would see consumerism in their face. So I put my gardens right on the streets, right along the sidewalk. I foraged from people's front yards. I, I, I helped people to immerse in this idea that food is growing freely and abundantly all around us. And that's why I chose being in the city. Plus, I met the Orlando Permaculture Group, which is a, ironically, Orlando uh, has a really nice group of people who grow a lot of food. There's a lot of plant people there. So, so I ended up there. Didn't know how to forage, so I started going to foraging classes. And basically, what I at the beginning when I started, I uh, I was going to the uh, web, you know, thing they call Google, and I would type in how much sun does a kale seed need, and how much water do you put on the carrots, and uh, <laughs> like just the basics. And I was googling it for every plant and trying to make a spreadsheet. And after a few months I realized, holy crap, there's all sorts of spreadsheets that have done this for me already. Even in this area, they, have, they exist. And so what I did is I opened myself up to the local resources. What I learned very quickly is that we know how to do all of it. There's just not many of us who are doing all of it. But we all have the skills between us to accomplish almost everything that we want to accomplish. So what I started to do is just gather all the local knowledge and put it together into a way where I could step away completely from the consumeristic, globalized, industrialized food system. And so I gave myself six months from when I arrived in Orlando to, when, to the point where I would be growing and foraging 100% of my food. So zero to 100 and six months was my goal. So I got to work, kinda. I also got distracted doing quite a few other things. And so six months turned into 10 months. But still, 10 months, never having grown anything in that state, having done very little foraging, recently just Googling how to grow a carrot, I launched into the, to the year on November 11, 2018. And the first day was the well, the first meal was the first meal that I ever ate in my entire life that I had completely grown and foraged. So I was jumping into the deep end. Uh, I had been, you know, I, I, what happened is I had started a bunch of other community projects, planting community fruit trees, building gardens for single moms, plant, uh, sending out free seed, project seeds, and I just got busy doing a bunch of other things. 
But I think it could have been started in six months. Anyway, that's not important at all. So ten months later, I ate the first meal. And um, that's it. So, any questions? What was the meal? Okay, what was the meal? Uh, the meal was actually a smoothie. It was three years ago. I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure there's a picture online if you want to go back to November 11, 2018 on the social media. It'll be there with a picture. I know it was a smoothie of all things from my garden. If you're new to growing food, remember perennials. They are exquisite. When you plant a perennial, a fruit, uh, you know, an apple tree is a perennial. You plant that apple tree, and you could be eating apples from that for decades. By 50, 50 years even, or, or potentially longer. You plant an acorn tree, and you could be eating from that for 400 years. So planting perennials, you know, bushes, uh, shrubs, like raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, they come back every year. So I focused on perennial greens. And then, even better yet, now, it's easy to be here, like Eric Joseph Lewis, where's he at? Uh, I guess he's off, pl off playing with the plants. <laughs> um, we, did a we did a plant walk earlier, and there's dozens of species of food growing all around here. But would you, most people wouldn't expect this, but food is growing freely and abundantly almost everywhere in all of the cities. Even, you know, actually New York City has some great foraging with their huge parks. Chicago, Atlanta, Los Angeles, the small towns, the, me you know, the megatropolises, if that's a word. Everywhere, there is food growing all around us, and when you tune into that, you start to see it. Um, you start to see that food is growing freely and abundantly all around us, and that in itself is extremely radical. Because that's saying, we don't need you corporations in order to have a happy, healthy, meaningful existence. We can work with the plants and attain that freedom from the monetary system. But the plants are one of the most amazing ways to do that. Um, one of my earliest lessons was the seminal pumpkin, which is this beautiful, heat-tolerant pumpkin that grows in mostly in semi-tropical areas. It's been grown in Florida for hundreds of years by the Seminole indigenous people. And uh, I learned about this plant and started to grow it, and what I realized, the beautiful lesson that I got is, I was at a friend's house, and he had the seminal pumpkin, and he took the seeds out, and what do most people do with the seeds? Well, some people eat them, the cool people eat them. A lot of people throw them in the garbage can. Some people compost them, but most people throw the seeds in the garbage can from the pumpkin. And I said, hey, can I have those seeds? And he's like, yeah, of course. And I was like, yes! <laughs> so I took those, the seeds from those two pumpkins home, and that turned into 169 pumpkins. What? Each of those pumpkins has 100 seeds in it. So that's like... A lot. <laughs> Somebody. 17,000 pumpkin seeds. You know what I could do with that? I could give one seed to, to 17,000 people, and the next generation, every human being in the city of Orlando could have been pumpkin self sufficient. That's the power of a seed. You know, you might have heard of Ron Finley, and one of the things he says is growing your own food is like printing your own money. He's one of my heroes, and it is. The power of the seed. One little seed can hold what can turn into the health and abundance of an entire community. It's truly powerful what is in those seeds. So, uh, they also taste good. Just, just, the pumpkin seeds are also good for eating. You don't have to give them all away. You can also just eat them. That is, that's a lot. Um, so, this the year started off pretty well. Um, and I continued on. Uh, eating lots of fruits, foraging for lots of fruits. Uh, I harvested my salt from the ocean. I did make my own coconut oil, but only a little bit, because it turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. So I went nine months without oil. That was one of the big struggles. Also, ironically, the greatest skill set that I had going into this, as far as being a you know, forager or gatherer, was fishing. I've, I've been fishing since I was eight years old. It's pretty much my happy place. And weirdly enough, I couldn't catch any fish. From I was just like flabbergasted. I was like, what is going on? I went out with all of my friends who were the best, best fisher people. All of them got skunked when I was on their boat. It was like, I was cursed for fish, man. But, so about halfway through the year, um, 
I started to become, I thought, deficient in fat and protein. That's where I was having the hardest time. Living in Orlando, I didn't have a car. I didn't have a gun. Uh, I couldn't easily get to, like, the coast. It was an hour and a half drive. So that was part of it. I didn't, it was, you know, not easy to access so much. Um, because a lot of people have said, like, dude, fishing in Florida? I mean, come on. That's, like, some of the easiest fishing in the world. But I had my reasons that I didn't do good fishing there. Also, it was cursed. <laughs> so uh, about halfway through the year, I started to become kind of deficient in fat and protein, I thought. I can't say for certain that that's what it was, but that's what it felt like. A little bit of uh, foggy brain, a um, little bit of just like, you know, achiness. And, um, so I ended up going up to northern Wisconsin for three months. And a lot of people said, oh, you, you know, you quit? Like, you went up there and ate pizza with your family? No. I brought 120,000 calories with me because 2,000 calories a day at 60 days means that I could survive at least for 60 days up there off the calories I brought. I did sit at the table and watch my family eat pizza, but I was not eating that pizza. So I went up there and I started to catch some lake trout. And then uh, one of the biggest lake trout throughs, is this thing still on? No. Uh, okay. But you can still hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. All right, I might. I don't want to switch things up too much right in the middle. Oh, I don't know about that, though. That's like a little intense. Go <laughs> 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 oh, further away. Where at, though? Like, there, there. I don't there. like that. I don't like that. Guys, treat it like an ice cream cone. You need a lot of ice cream, by the way. Um, how's this? That's good. It's good. <laughs> All right, I got to be honest about one thing. This is the first time I have ever given a talk after having a little meeting with my plant friend, Marijuana. So, <laughs> I wanted to see how it would go, and I thought this was the crew for that. You're a natural. All right, I'm saying I'm sure. All right. And I just want to say, it is a plant friend. It's all about... All these plans, it's about how you work with them. You can choose to turn them into something negative, or they can be a wonderful friend in medicine. And they all are, in one way, way shape, or form for another, whatever, something like that. <laughs> you got it. Okay, so, uh, okay, the big savior was, it started to cool off up there. I gotta be honest, Florida's summers were brutal, and I did flee. I did flee from them. <laughs> Um, and then what happened was, up there, um, the deer were plentiful, not because I had a gun, but because a lot of people hit deer with cars. And so some people call them roadkill deer, but what I call them is deer that are hit by cars. Because roadkill comes first, and then you're, you're, you're removing the identity of that deer and saying it is something. It's still a deer. It was deer before it was a hit, it's a deer afterwards, but it was hit by a car. So it's still a deer. And depending on how it's hit, it can be a really good deer still. For example, if it's hit in the head and none of its body is, the whole body is still edible. So I started to eat a lot of deer while I was up there, especially because I still was pretty cursed for the fishing thing. Um, so the end was, I ended in the fall, and uh, I actually ended up at UW La Crosse, where I went to university, and they actually, they actually about a month after I had the, the fat and deficiency, uh, I stopped there, and they ha I happened to be staying with like the physical dude, the dude who does, you know, like dunk tanks where you, you learn your body fat percentage and stuff. So he put me in that thing, and my body fat percentage was up to 50 15, 15 percent. So I, you know, I managed to work it back with the gear and the and some of the fish that I was catching. Went back to Florida. My garden was just a jungle because that's how food forestry works. Not that it was a food forest, it was too young, but the idea of permaculture, one of the sayings is maximizing hammock time. You design the garden in a way where it's less work where you can spend more time in the hammock. I actually don't like hammocks, but a lot of people do. So if you like hammocks, that's a good thing for you, but not for me. Uh, <laughs> it's not that I don't like them, I just don't enjoy spending time with them. No problem with them in themselves. <laughs> So anyway, I get back to Florida, and uh, I'm in great health. I finish off the year um, in, I, I end feeling, honestly, the best that I've felt in my adult life. I felt great, the best physical condition I had been in my adult life. And this, for me, the biggest lesson was 
You know, I don't know who said it. Maybe hypocrisy is let thy food be thy medicine. <laughs> You're allowed to let those things slide. You don't have to laugh at me. Hypocrisies? Hypocrisies. Hypocrisies. You get it. You don't need all the words to get the story. So, um, so where was I going? <laughs> Let thy food be thy medicine. I absolutely, that's the thing. All foods are medicine. And everything that you put in your body that's toxic to you is the opposite of that. And the more things that you put into your body that harm you, the more medicine that you actually need. What we do is we pump ourselves with pharmaceuticals. But simply by not putting the bad stuff in our body in the first place and filling our body with good stuff, we don't need those pharmaceutical medicines. The plants are our medicine, every single one. Christy over here got stung by a wasp and she, she learned to put a little plantago on the eyebrow there when you're stung by a wasp. It reduces swelling. It's one of my favorite plant medicines. And uh, they're all around us. These are, a lot of these are weeds, you know, things that people despise. They hate them. They're stabbing them, they're poisoning them, and there are medicines, there's such wonderful plants, the dandelion, all of these. So I finish out the year feeling really good, and uh, I was, the end though, I, honestly, I was pretty anxious at the end, and I was pretty uh, stressed, because for the last like month or two, everybody asked the same question, what's the first thing you're going to eat when you're done? And I'm like, man, that's so, that created so much anxiety to be having to try to figure out what the first thing was going to be. <laughs> but uh, first thing ended up being a friend of mine, uh, Pete Canaris, maybe some of you have seen his YouTube channel, he brought me a coconut that he had foraged, I hadn't foraged it, so it was a good way to like work into it. <laughs> but, uh, and through that, I've, it's been, what, two years now, and I've held on to uh, everywhere I go, I find food and I, and I eat it. And I don't even remember that I'm eating a lot of times, it's just food is everywhere. And, but with that being said, I also do that at Ben and Jerry's in Asheville as well. I, I eat a lot of nuts. I, you know, most of my diet right now is not grown in forage. Uh, I'm amazed at how quickly I reverted back to being okay with putting things in my body that I didn't want to. But sugar's a real thing, man, and it's hard to avoid it a lot of the times. So um, it was a wonderful year, and two things I want to say. One. The only reason I could do this was because of community. First, the community that has existed for thousands of years prior to us who have gotten so disconnected from our food. The only reason that any permaculturists are able to share anything with me or the current gardeners or the foragers is because people have been doing this for thousands of years prior to that. And so, in the greatest sense possible, the only reason that I was able to do this at all was community. Like, technically, I was the only person that I was, was growing and foraging all my food, but even beyond that, when you come to the local people, I was only able to do it because of the gardeners and the foragers and the books that, and the books and the, the internet information. The only reason I was able to do it was because of community. And even building my gardens, people came together and they volunteered. Not altruistically, they got to learn how to, you know, start gardening by helping me build my garden. It was all about bringing community together as much as possible. And the other big part about it is it wasn't just about growing and foraging all, my, all of my own food. It was about empowering others to do it as well. The reason I do these things so publicly, like, I could totally do this, like, quiet in the woods by myself, but I do it because I'm trying to penetrate the minds of mainstream society. And I go to extremes to do that because our media is extreme and sometimes we need a message that really can get in there and get to people and get them to question things. Um, so, but the, the community like came together and the only reason I was able to do it was because of community. And that's uh, the beauty of life. So yeah, thank you all so much for being here and for spending this time together. And I'd love to answer any questions that you have. They could be wacky or they could be pretty normal. Either one is totally fine. Eric, what's your favorite wild food of all of the, like, I guess, favorite in calories and favorite in flavor? So this is Eric Joseph Lewis right here. He's a 
Well, we call him Master Forager. <laughs> Definitely, if you get a chance to do a plant walk with him, if you get plant opportunities to do plant walks in general, there's a lot of plant walkers around here, people who walk and show you plants. Take that opportunity, it's amazing. My favorite food is whatever is growing, me, growing abundantly around me. I have such an affinity for whatever there's so much of that it's just there and I know that it's nutritious. I don't know the nutritional factoids of almost any foods. I just eat lots of foods from the land and I believe that will pretty much work. So far, so good. Could be a horrible experiment, who knows. But I'm pretty sure we existed before nutritionists existed. Not exactly sure, but pretty sure. Um, so that's my favorite food. Uh, and then, favorite as far as taste goes? Whew, can't do it. Can't do it, next question. <laughs> For those of us who aren't great fisher people, are you going to add more animals to like your farming like circles? And yes, and I also just way? realized that I will uh, answer the question with the question in case you don't hear it. The question was for those of us that aren't fisher people, are you going to add animals when you do it here, if I do it here? Uh, hopefully, but we'll see. Um, and the answer is if I have animals, for that year, I also had to grow or forage 100% of their food. So if I had chickens, I couldn't be buying feed to feed to them. So that's why I didn't have any animals. Um, because that would just be still getting food from the system and just converting it into something else. Um, so probably for me, the most likely scenario is, for me personally, I like my interaction with the animal to be one where they spend you know, their whole life wild and then we meet for a short period of time. That's what calls to me, so that's probably more likely what I'll be doing. Yeah, so I'll take the uh, same question, but you've been here for a month, so it's uh, July yeah. in Asheville. Okay, so I've been here for a month. It's July in Asheville. I was here for June. What's my favorite right now? Okay, well, service berries or June berries? Those were just busted all yeah. over in the city. Like, fruit trees everywhere. Love that. I thought I was eating chicory, but according to Eric, it's mostly wild lettuce, which I believe this guy. He knows what he's talking about. Lots of greens, lots of pokeweed, plantago, uh, dandelion, some chicory, wild lettuces. Uh, lots of stinging nettle. I love stinging nettle. I made stinging nettle tea from the tree down there a few hours ago. Lots of mint. I love mint. Um, and uh, hopefully tomorrow we're going to go out foraging some, for some mushrooms, some milky caps maybe, maybe some chanterelles, maybe some lobster mushrooms. Um, so yeah, those are some of my favorites at the moment. Like that's what I really want in life is truth. And consumerism is the opposite of truth. That's all that I feel like a lot of the times that I'm resisting is, is, is sort of the lies that are put out for our society. And I find truth in this. I find a lot of truth in this. And so as much as I'd love to do that, for me, like we all have our place in life. We all have our ability to find our purpose and our passion and our mission. And you know, when I was in fifth grade, I like basically started to make people laugh and I became sort of a class clown. And when I was in about 10 years old, I realized I, I'm an entertainer. Like that's actually what I do. Uh, it's what I love, it's one of my passions. And so I gotta be around people for that. I mean, I like talking to myself, but not nearly as much as being around people. And so, and society is what needs, society is what I'm hoping will change so that we stop destroying this earth that we live on. So what I have to do is look at each situation, not as a black and white scenario, but as a, as a shade of gray and say, what is the best thing for me to do in this scenario in order to walk lightly, but at the same time be able to shift society? And I found that the best way that I can do that is to be a part of it. I remove myself to large, you know, large degrees as I can, but what I don't do is remove myself in ways that actually wouldn't create the change that I feel is needed. So there's you know, the idea of transitional ethics. You know, we have to be in a time where we have our ideals, but we can't necessarily have them right now. And so we have to work towards that. And that means critical thinking. That means problem solving. It means not having labels and saying, okay, this is vegan, therefore it's safe, it's good for animals. No, some vegan food is the worst thing for animals, and some of it's 
great. But some, you know, working with animals is regenerating our earth, and some of it's destroying our earth. So it's all about critical thinking and problem solving and looking, you know, deeply at the scenario. So for me, I actually have very little trouble like walking in society because I'm I'm like comfortable with that. That's the reality that I'm in and and I, I truly believe that that's the best way of going about it. So yeah. Yeah. What kind of amendments did I use to build the soil and then who paid for it? I paid for it because I used almost all waste products that cost next to nothing. Um, so first I layered the ground with cardboard free from the dumpsters. Then you layer it with mulch, which is the byproduct of tree cutting down companies. They don't make money off mulch, they'll dump it for you for free. You layer your whole yard with mulch, as much as like a foot of it, and then that starts to retain moisture, that starts to break down and turn into soil, that starts to bring in microorganisms and actually create life that is beneficial to plants. It creates the soil itself. If you do that and you walk away for a year and you come back, you have soil, basically. So if you have land and you want to do that in the future, you want to be growing food in the future but not aren't ready, do that. Throw the cardboard down, throw a foot of mulch down, and then come back in a year, and you can start growing food there. Now with that being said, I got another waste product, which was mushroom compost, which is the the food, the, uh, the material, the medium they grow mushrooms in, factory farm mushrooms. If you're buying mushrooms from the grocery store, they're you know probably factory farm. So I would get the waste product from that, which was super nutrient dense. And in a way, actually, almost cheating, because this was a byproduct of the globalized, industrialized food system. But uh, for me, it was I just couldn't eat from it, and you could use utilize wasted resources, but not dumpster diving. Some people call that urban foraging, but for the year, it was no eating food from dumpsters. But I was using waste products from the industrial system in order to be able to establish fertility in a short period of time to grow food. Uh, so, and within a few months of that first garden, the first garden that I created cost $550-ish, and within a few months it was producing that amount of food every month. So it pays for itself very quickly once you start to invest in your food and think, you know, forward. I was curious, what sort of Well, so there's the people that I worked with directly, which is a very small number of people in comparison to the number of people that just like watch my videos and see that it's possible. I mean, walking downtown Asheville the other day, a guy looks up to me, he's like, I turned my whole front yard into a garden from watching your YouTube video, man. I get that hundreds of times a month, you know? So people see it, they're like, I didn't know you could do that. And then they do it, because now they know. It's as simple as putting other options out there. That's the idea, showing people another way it's possible. And then as far as the people we built gardens for, um, you know, for many, for some of them, it was, you know, a nice benefit. It was, you know, adding a little beauty to their lives. But, you know, one, one person actually told me that the garden saved their life. That looking out the window at the garden was the reason that they were still alive. Because they were dealing with depression issues and this garden brought this life to them and kept them going through so some of the gardens were you know pretty powerful and that's, plants are powerful and some of them were some of them were more neglected and people didn't really get into it as well all right I think we have time for about two questions and I will say uh, afterwards I am totally here to hang out that's totally why I'm here so definitely don't be shy come up Got the blue wristband on, and it means I'm open for hugs. Um, and uh, just you know, I, I'm 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 elated to be here with you all. And uh, yeah, so let's go with one more question. Do you work with gray water, black water, rain catchment? Yes. So then you work with gray water, black water, rain catchment. Um, so I don't do black water because I do compost toilets. I try not to poop in our water. Um, because it's not an efficient usage of our water and it causes, you would be surprised, I'll give you one little tidbit. I was in Vero Beach, Florida, and there was a headline that said, I think it was three million gallons of raw sewage spilled into the river. And I'm like, dang, three million gallons? And it says, under that, fourth largest in two years. Oh my God. And I was like, 
This is happening all the time. Our poop is going to that water a lot. So what I do is a you know, compost toilet, a dry toilet. It's one of the simplest things. For me, it was kind of the holy grail. It took me five years to get to it because you know, that's a big part about this is social stigmas. If you think about it, what am I doing? Oh, I poop in a bucket and deal with my own poop. Like, it's not really the coolest thing for most people in society. Cool. And ultimately, that's the most important lesson that I've got probably through all of this. Although I shouldn't say most important, there's a lot of good ones, but the, one of the most important lessons I've gotten through all of this is just to stop worrying what other people think about you. Because if you think about it, if you spend one hour a day basing your life off what other people think, you know, you know, just doing ourselves up, and uh, one hour a day of just like, yeah, what would they think about that, so should I do it or should I not, that adds up to three years of your life. Now, if you take into account sleeping, it's five years of your waking life. Imagine, you just got five years of life because you decided that you're going to spend time thinking about things way more important. So what I decided to do is I would start thinking about life not through the lens of what other people will think, but through the lens of, is this beneficial to the earth? Is this beneficial to my community? And is this beneficial to myself? And basically, that's absolutely what set myself free to be able to do any of this, was removing that unnecessary lens so that I could actually just, you know, immerse as a human being that is able to freely think uh, for the betterment of the bigger picture, rather than, you know, our own little skag selves. So yeah, this was fun. <laughs> this is the one that I wrote, and uh, it's one of my favorites from that chapter. It's called Golden. Every morning a poem from my father. Hey, cool limerick, really can't be bothered. Every morning a word from my mother. Every morning a word from my sister Prankster, priestess, jokester, trickster Every morning a song from my mother Shy but a Mozart, secret undercover Every morning a meal from my lover Straight from the garden, sage and a clover Oh yeah, straight from the garden, sage and a clover Trip to the river, wild rushing water never fails to deliver. So life is fun while everything is calling. Take a deep breath, lean into the stall, and it's all that we ask for. But it really never looked like this. Don't sit back now, don't be dismissive. We're sitting in the mystery, real life living history, and no one's really sure if it's apocalypse or victory. No one's really sure if it's apocalypse or victory. I still don't think we're sure. <laughs> All the lessons learned seems we are beholding. And we walk towards our own death and know we are golden. All the lessons learned seems we are beholding. And we walk Towards our own death and know we are golden.
I hope that you enjoyed that talk and that you enjoyed the music of Leah from Rising Appalachia. This was kind of uh, spur of the moment as far as putting this video together. We had planned this event and our friend Charlie ended up filming it and so we got to take you along for part of my talk and just one of the many beautiful songs that Leah sang. So I'm so glad that we captured it and were able to, to share part of the evening with you. It was just for me, a, just a complete pleasure and honor to be able to host this night with Leah from Rising Appalachia. Um, she's been one of my favorite musicians for about five years now. She has brought me so much joy and contentment, uh, so much motivation to to be the change that I wish to see, you know, to be an activist. She's not just uh, an incredible musician, but she is an incredible activist and all around human being. So highly recommend checking out her and Rising Appalachia's music on their website. They have a YouTube channel as well and social media. And if you can catch them at a concert in person, it's a really great crowd of people to spend time with and just I mean all very very good vibes around rising Appalachia so I hope that you enjoyed it I hope that you will take some of this inspiration away to gain food freedom and uh, gain food sovereignty in your community and uh, enjoy the beautiful music and the beautiful life while you're doing it so love you all very much and see you again soon